Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As you can tell, I'm on a little bit of leave right now. Um, I have a couple of holes, holes in my stomach. I went through some hernia surgery, so I'm about halfway through my recovery. So I apologize if I'm not as uh, animated and vocal as I normally am. Today we're talking about uh, AIAMD, which is the Army Integrated Air Missile Defense. Before we get too far into this, I do want to go, of course, give a shout out to our sponsors. Of course, Aerial Resupply Coffee. The link is in my bio. We'll get you 10% off. It is premium coffee. It's veteran owned and operated. Uh, I, I know the CEO. He is a great guy. Um, he wants to do a lot of things for veterans. He is an up and coming company. And uh, before you purchase, just remember, it's not another veteran owned coffee company. It's the coffee company veterans have deserved all along. So go ahead and check that out. I also have a merch link in bio with new shirts coming online pretty regularly. So make sure you go ahead and check those out. My newest one is uh, about my friend, the F-22. Would you intercept me? I'd intercept me. So anyways, what is AIAMD? So AIAMD, let's go ahead and look this up, um, is the Army Integrated Air and Missile Defense. Now, keep in mind, we're going to use two acronyms kind of interchangeably here is AIAMD and IBCS. So AIAMD, we'll tell you what IBCS is here in a second. AIAMD or Army Integrated Air Missile Defense is the the program. We are trying to integrate all of these different missile defense programs together to create AIAMD. Now IBCS from Northrop Grumman, which is the Integrated Air Missile Defense Battle Command System. Yes, it's an acronym within an acronym. Welcome to the United States military. IBCS is the is the solution. So the program is this is AIAMD. And IBCS is right now the end solution. That is the, the, the actual product that is bringing a lot of these things together. So AIAMD is a command and control system that integrates engagement operations centers, EOCs, Sentinel air surveillance radars, and Patriot missile system radars and launchers across an integrated fire control network, IFCN. We're going to keep in mind, I'm going to break down all these acronyms so you understand what they are, what they look like, and, and kind of how they operate well within the confines of... Um, publicly available information. Now I did work on this program for four years, but everything I'm telling you guys is not covered by a non-disclosure agreement and is thus a uh, public domain because it is on these different companies' web pages, okay? All right, EOCs provide the operating environment for soldiers to monitor and direct sensor employment and engagement of air threats. Hardware interface kits connect adapted Patriot and Sentinel components to the IFCN, the Integrated Fire Control Network, either through an EOC, an Engagement Operations Center, or through an IFCN relay. Remember, Integrated Fire Control Network. So I'm going to I'm gonna say the acronym about three or four times, then I'm just going to stop and I'm going to use the acronym. So if you got to go back... It is what it is. Uh, IFC and relays also provide mobile communication nodes to extend fire control connectivity to distributed operations. Air defense artillery forces will use AIAMD system to provide the timely direction, identification, monitoring, and, if required, engagement of air threats in support of active defense of the homeland, critical asset locations, and forces. That was a lot of of words. All right. Now I understand I read through that. That is directly from the do the dot.ost.mil, um, which is the first page that popped up on Google when I, I typed in AIAMD. Now the picture they have there at the top of the page is of an uh an S280 and an ICE. Now the S280 is the shelter. The ICE is the integrated collaborative environment. Uh has 10 consoles inside there. Um these are I guess you could you could call that IBCS, right? Um, but it's also AIAMD. It's it's a little confusing, but don't worry, we're we're gonna explain a lot of these things. So, I guess first of all, what is the tactical implication of having a system like this? Like, why is AIAMD such a big deal? Well, it's because it's doing something that no other country in the world has ever even tried, let alone succeeded in doing, right? Now, so when we talk about one sensor being able to detect something and another sensor being able to shoot something, it doesn't sound like that far-fetched of an idea. But think about it like this, right? What most countries and nations currently do is one sensor would paint a target or laze a target and then something else would engage said target, right? Like that's that's old technology, that's new. But what if you could fire an air defense missile and have another sensor mid-flight grab that interceptor and guide it into its target to a target that that initial sensor couldn't identify. It's kind of a crazy, weird sci-fi Skynet idea, right? But it's not that far away. So I'll go ahead and tag it. I'll, I'll link it below in the description. There's another video called IBCS Flight Test 5. That is where I personally, me, fired two Patriot Advanced Capability Version 2, Pack 2 interceptors at two targets that I couldn't see with my individual Patriot sensor using... AIAMD. Now, the cool thing about this is 
while my missiles were in the air and heading towards their target, I could see them through the IFCN, the Integrated Fire Control Network. I could see them through this system, but my Patriot sensor couldn't see them. Mid-flight, an F-35 grabbed both of my interceptors and guided them into their targets, and I had two shots and two kills. I successfully engaged two... Um, they were drones, but they were flying a cruise missile profile, so they were they were trying to fly as cruise missiles low and fast through uh, some terrain. And an F-35 had a much higher detection and capability on both of those threats. Um, and this was done in December of 2019. I believe it was December 13th of 2019. So here we are in 2023, and we're still talking about IBCS and IFCN and what it brings to the fight. Um, so... Again, no other nation in the world has ever done something like that. Use a ground-based air defense system and guided it in with air-based combat systems. So the entire idea would be that when you move into an area, especially with an, an IBCS or AIAMD, right? When you move into an area, all of these sensors network together. Again, sounds like a really simple idea, but it's very difficult because up until now, all of these sensors, and some of them are, are very old, like Patriot is, is relatively old, right? It's been around for 30, 40 years. Now you start adding in like Spy 6 or Spy 7 from the Navy, which are damn near brand new, or you have a AN Tippy 2, which is a THAAD sensor, which is maybe 10 to 15 years old. All of these sensors, all of these programs, they all speak a little bit different language. Not just because they're designed by different companies, but because that's how they were designed, right? They weren't designed to run all on the same band. So you have one company, uh, which Northrop Grumman has the contract for this, trying to integrate all these different sensors, but all of these different sensors speak different languages. So trying to make them backwards compatible with each other, pass the information in the right language to one central location is an overwhelming and daunting task. But what does this bring to the warfighter? Well, okay, so when you're looking at laying down AIAMD, uh, we're going to go to North of Grumman's page, right? Uh, because this, this changes... Uh, with every time you, you flip a page, right? So right now their their big mantra for IBCS is multi-domain, any sensor best effector. It used to be um, any shooter, any sensor, and then it was best shooter, best sensor, and now I guess they got completely rid of the shooter and are just calling it best effector. The goal would be is that if this interceptor that is attached to this system has the highest probability of kill on this threat, but it's in a position. Remember, sensors are limited by the topography and geography around them. They are limited by that, as well as the power, weather, the, all these things can affect a radar. But let's say that this radar has a really good viewpoint of that threat, but its missiles have a staggering reduce in probability of kill, right? So the goal would be you could use this thing's view and this thing's missiles to engage and destroy that target in real time. That would be the end state goal. Again, sounds really simple, but when you get into it and you start looking at the background processes and the ones and zeros, it's an incredibly daunting task because the United States military uses dozens of different surveillance radars, missile defense radars. We have um, combat radars, ground, uh, uh, was it ground-based, air-based radars, satellite-based radars. This is just, there's so many different things. So it's it's piece by piece, one at a time, and we're, we're bringing all of these things together, right? So right now, if you look here at Northrop Grumman and at that uh, that other webpage, the, uh, the DOT and E, um, it explains, and this is from 2021, it explains that right now that it has integration with Patriot and Sentinel. Um, but if you go to Northrop Grumman's webpage, they're talking about ANTP-2 as well as SPY-1 uh, Spy from the United States Navy Aegis. Um, now, we do know that uh, very recently, Patriot Pack 3 Rig 360, which is Remote Interceptor Guided 360 Pack 3 Patriot Advanced Capability Version 3 interceptors have been fired off of an Aegis ashore. And that's crazy to be able to fire somebody else's missiles off of a system that was never designed to fire those, right? Because you have to, they have to talk the right language, they have to talk to each other. So again, another another part of these tasks because nobody's stuff wants to play with one another. But then you also have like things like, does this radar have the ability to have the high fidelity data to be able to guide this interceptor in? Or does it not have enough, right? Again, one of the many, many problems that run into uh, AIAMD, which is why no one in the world has ever tried this. It's such a weird thing, right? S300s, S400s, everything fires in a vacuum. They're 
I mean, yeah, they can maybe look at each other's tracks, but they can't fire off of each other's data. It's it's unheard of anywhere else in the world. Iron Dome doesn't do this. David Sling doesn't do this. They look at each other's stuff, but they can't fire off of each other's stuff. No one in the world has this capability. Naysams can't do this. Iris T can't do this. Like there's, there's so many different things out there that just cannot do this because it's been such an overwhelming task. But here's the other thing. We're going to add in another layer of difficulty. Not all sensors are made the same. Not all of them are made the same. So what happens is, is you can have two brand new Patriot sensors side by side looking in the same direction and they are looking at the same track in the air, the same exact target. And both of those are going to see it a little bit different from each other. They're just going to see it that way. One of them is going to see it maybe a little bit to the left. Maybe, maybe one of them will see it a little bit low. And then when you start overlapping all of these sensors on top of each other and they're all looking at the same things flying through the air, what, what would be one thing flying through the air now looks like 10 things flying through the air in a close formation, right? That's dangerous. That's very dangerous. Now, it doesn't explain how, but it does explain in the video on Northrop Grumman's page. Again, I'll put that in the description at the bottom. But it explains that the system can compensate for any kind of mechanical biases. So we've, we've talked about in, increased engagement range and capability and distance. But let's talk about the real, real heavy hitter here is reduction in manpower. So previously you had 60, 70 guys have to go out and in place a system and monitor that system at all times. Now you can have 30 of them in place that system and then just make sure it's okay and functioning and its repairs are done and everything else. But somebody who through the integrated fire control network in another location is fighting that system and paying attention to everything that it's doing. They are in a remote location. So you're simultaneously increasing your area of control while decreasing the manning requirements. Which right now, if you look at the United States military, um, I can't remember exactly where I read it. I'll see if I can find it on here. But around 50% of America's, uh, or excuse me, the United States Army's air and missile defense forces are deployed at any given time. Around 50% of air defenders are deployed at any given time. That is unsustainable. Um, right now, luckily, I'm in a position where I don't deploy from uh, in this location. But most duty stations that we go to... Uh, as an air defender, you'll be spending 12 months out and 24 months back, or you'll be spending nine months out and 18 months back. Um, really depends on how your rotation schedule goes, but uh, that's that's the way it is for air defenders. You're just constantly going. Um, you're constantly located in different locations. Um, so having a capability like this where we can increase our footprint while decreasing manning requirements is going to stop burning out air defenders so much, which is a huge force multiplier. Um, again, I want this system to come online as fast as everybody else, but I'm not willing to jeopardize anyone's lives to do it. Um, there are some quirks and some issues with the system already. Uh, many of those we have brought up uh, and the system is not out for full release yet. It's not. Uh, because we, we as well as many other highly intelligent people who are working on this program, are bringing things to the fight and explaining deficiencies so we can fix them before they end up in an operator's hands in, in a real life situation. Um, and the way I used to explain it, I did explain this to, I uh, uh, can't remember the name of the colonel, probably wouldn't say his name here if I could, uh, as I was like, you know, you wouldn't send an infantryman over, overseas with a rifle, it doesn't work. So I'm not going to send an air defender overseas with a system that doesn't work. This thing will be as close to perfect as we can possibly get it before someone's life relies on it. And that's not anything bad about the system. It's just, it's it's a completely new idea. It's a completely revolutionary plan. It's completely beyond anything anyone in the world has ever tried. Right now, 343 Air Defense Artillery out of Fort Bliss, Texas is the first operational unit to have this system. However, they are not deploying with it. They have done several limited user tests with it. I've worked very closely with 343. Um, they <laughs> they have their opinions about the system, but I worked with the system a long time before that when it was far worse. The Air Missile Defense Test Detachment at White Sands Missile Range is doing the, the developmental test of this, and then the operational test is 343. They're the first operational unit to have it, and they're putting it through its paces, and they are they are beating the hell out of it because that's what air defenders do. We, we run these things, and we run them hard to just make sure that we can get these things functioning because they need to function on the battlefield. Air defenders do not have the privilege of a second chance. We don't have the privilege of failure. If I, failure, if I fail at my job once, a thousand, a hundred thousand, a million people might die. If an infantryman fails at their job, I mean, 10, 12 people might die. Don't get me wrong, that's a terrible experience. But at the same time, that's apples and oranges. You really can't compare those things. One of the things that is really cool about the system is that you can circumstantially have one of these 
anywhere and somebody who has the power and the the control to make these decisions because you have a joint kill chain right like depending on what is flying out there and and a certain predetermined amount of criteria you know i can shoot at it or somebody else can shoot at it or nobody can shoot at it what whatever and sometimes it has to go to a person who has a star or some oak leaves or whatever on their chest and they go yeah that needs to die well previously that data had to be passed to them through a bunch of back doors and in, in this other architecture where they could just see it but they couldn't pull the trigger on it so then they would say yeah kill that thing and they would say like a telephone game hey kill that thing hey kill that thing hey kill that thing hey kill that thing and then by the time it gets down to me i have seconds if that to react right well now everybody all the way up can see the exact same thing and that person at the top who can make that decision can just go a couple of clicks and say hey kill that thing and i get a pop-up hey guess what kill it and i go okay click okay go through my other processes check everything out make sure that the the data is is uh correct on what i'm about to engage birds away knock it out of the sky so again the idea of ai amd is so revolutionary it's going to save lives it's going to allow faster and more fluid engagements it's going to shorten the joint kill chain while increasing the area of control and decreasing manning requirements there are so many things that ai amd brings to the table with all these new processes coming online and we haven't even started talking about satellite integration which uh due to another article that i was reading uh, it was july of 2022 the united states uh offered or concluded a 1.6 billion dollar contract to track hypersonic objects with a satellite network so once we integrate that it's again going to be another game changer for this system right um and ultimately it, it's based off of keeping people alive keeping people alive so we've seen what one patriot system one has done for the ukrainians in kiev now, don't get me wrong. It's been put through its paces. It has been putting in some serious work. And I personally have never seen a Patriot system fight that hard in my life, aside from in simulations. In simulations, I've seen that, but I've never seen it in real life. Um, so imagine that times 10. I'm sorry. The whole idea of, oh, Patriot got destroyed is so laughable to me because every time they're like, oh, we got it. Two days later, it's firing missiles again. Like, come on, dude. Come on. Like, Every time they say it's destroyed, a day later it's firing missiles. So like, look, man, if it was destroyed, cool, it's destroyed. Nothing's invincible in warfare, but it's not because it's still continuing to shoot. Imagine being able to move into an area and you said, okay, I need these sensors in these exact locations and they're all networked together and now boom, I can see everything everywhere. There is no mass terrain. And by the way, we just put up some AWACS, some F-35s. We got some satellite imagery. Everything is networked together. Nobody can hide anywhere. And my forces, my people are safe. That is the end state goal. This isn't, you can't use this system offensively, at least not as far as I know, right? You can't use this to, we're going to invade somewhere. No. This is strictly a defensive capability. The end goal is keeping people safe. This system means nothing if someone doesn't throw something at you. So for anyone in the comment section who might be getting upset and saying that this is a weapon of war and you're going to use it to oppress and blah, 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 because you don't understand world politics and you have no idea how World War I happened, how World War II happened, and how the privilege of neutrality is not something the United States or NATO has had for the last 100 years because every time we've tried staying out of shit, oh, I don't know, We've had the Lusitania sank, we've had Pearl Harbor, we've had, um, what was it, the London Blitz, we've had, uh, well, Dunkirk. I mean, every time the United States and our allies have tried to stay out of shit, it has not turned out well for us. So before any one of my comment sections says anything about us being the global oppressors, realize that if we weren't there, you would be getting oppressed. That is the entire purpose of this. Um, Go ahead and ask any more uh, questions you have at the bottom. I hope I gave you a well-rounded understanding of what IBCS or excuse me, AIAMD is and the, the purpose of it. Now, I can't get too far into the, a lot of the details of how these things work, how the integration works, uh, certain other background processes, mechanical biases, how they how they compensate for these things, the, the code levels, the all that stuff. I can't get into that um, because of non-disclosure agreements. Everything I've given you is, is public release right here on their pages. So um, as always, do not give in to the 22 a day. Every single one of you are amazing, and I will see you guys right here next time. Play me out.